Today I'll be reading Essay 4 from The Politics of Reality, Essays in Feminist Theory by Marilyn Fry. <clears throat> I might need to take a short break at some point, it's quite a long essay. In and Out of Harm's Way, Arrogance and Love. Introduction. Most of this essay is devoted to constructing an account of some of the mechanisms of the exploitation and enslavement of women by men in phallocentric culture. Understanding such things is obviously important in, in a general way to feminist theory and strategies. It is essential, as they say, to know your enemy. But there is a more specific need of feminist theorists and activists with which these analyses also address at another level. This is the need to locate a point of purchase for a radical feminist vision. The accounts here of the mechanisms of exploitation and enslavement yield up a vivid picture of a kind of harm characteristically done the victims of these operations. Seeing these things as harmful is fundamental to my belief that women's being subjected to such mechanism mecha machinations is an evil. This is a place where a feminist politics can begin, but it cannot end here. When we see the effects of these mach machinations as harm, we implicitly invoke a contrast between the victims and the female human animal unharmed, unharmed at least by these particular processes. Although such an animal may be unknown in contemporary human experience, we are committed at least to an abstract conception of her. More than an abstract conception is needed if we are not simply to condemn but to resist effectively or escape. For that, we need a revolutionary vision, which in turn requires that we have, a rich, Im have rich images of such animal. Feminist imaginings of women not harmed by men's exploitation and enslavement, like the similar imaginings of other revolutionary visionaries, have often been malnourished on sentimentality and contempt. We sit soar on the evidence of women's achievements and dream of dreams of Amazon perfection and sink in the evidence of our mediocrity and the morass of our own internalized woman hating. If it is important to imagine women untouched by phallic machinations, then we must take care to discover that we can know here and can and now on that imagining can be fed. <clears throat> the analyses in the body of this essay tell us some of what we need to know. They suggest general correctiveness, correctives to poor vision. They enhance our understanding of the harm done women by the processes of subordination and enslavement, and so facilitate our understanding of the creature who is harmed. The harm lies in that these processes do to women. The analyses make clear what these processes produce as product. Understanding something of the stages and goals of the processing, one can see what shapes and qualities it imposes. This, in turn, suggests something of the nature of, of the being which is processed. One can reason that this being would not have had those shapes and those qualities if left unmolested. This sort of thinking back through phallocentric processes, sorry, process, turn out to provide valuable clues to the feminist visionary. Coercion. To coerce or... <clears throat> To coerce is to make or force someone to do something. This seems pretty straightforward, but some of the uses of this concept are not, and one might get confused. The law in some states, and general opinion in most places would have it, for instance, that an act is not rape unless the woman's engagement in sexual intercourse is coerced, and will not count the act as coerced unless the alleged victim of the alleged crime is literally physically overcome to the point where the rapist or rapists literally physically control the movements of the victim's limbs and the location and position of her body. In any other case, she is seen as choosing intercourse over other alternatives and thus is not being coerced. The curious thing about this interpretation of coercion is that it has the consequence that there is no such thing as a person being coerced into doing something. 
For if the movements of one's limbs and the location of a and position of one's body are not physically under one's control, one surely cannot be said to have done anything, except perhaps at the level of flexing one's muscles in resistance to the force. Given this way of thinking, one could reason that if one did anything beyond the level of flexing muscles, then it would follow that one was not coerced, and in this sense, and in the sense of free, that only means not coerced, all actions and all choices would be free. Sartre took this economical route to freedom and embraced the absurd conclusion of profundity. <clears throat> this is a quote from Sartre. If I am mobilized in a war, this war is my war. It is in my image and I deserve it. I deserve it first because I could always get out of it by suicide or by desertion. For lack of getting out of it, I have chosen it. This can be due to inertia, to cowardice in the face of public opinion, or because I prefer certain other values to the value of refusal to join the war. Any way you look at it, it is a matter of choice. Therefore, we must agree with the statement by John Remains, quote, in war, there are no innocent victims, end quote. If, therefore, I have preferred war to death or to dishonor, everything takes place as if I bore the entire responsibility for this war. There was no compulsion here. <clears throat> it should not be surprising that the same small mind em embracing a foolish consistency cannot recognize rape when he sees it and employs a magical theory of quote-unquote bad faith to account for its evidence. In the face of the women denying forthrightly that she experiences pleasure in coitus with her husband, the psychiatrist's observation that she quote-unquote dreads the experience and the woman's report that she deliberately averts her attention from the act and the sensations, Sartre insists that what she dreads and tries to distract herself from is quote-unquote pleasure and that the woman is self-deceived. The quote-unquote frigid woman does, after all, choose intercourse over suicide. This is sufficient to convince Sartre that she cannot be a victim and there can be no compulsion here. It is by this kind of reasoning that we are convinced that women's choices to enter and remain within the institutions of heterosexuality, marriage, and motherhood are free choices, that prostitution is freely is a freely chosen life, and that all slaves who have not risen up and killed their masters or committed suicide have freely chosen their lots as slaves. But choice and action obviously can take place under coercion. The paradigm of coercion is not the direct or and overpowering application of force to move or arrange someone's body and limbs. The situation of coercion must be one in which choice and action do take place and in which the victim's body and limbs are moved under the victim's own steam, their emotions determined by the victim's own perception and judgment. Hence, in this standard case, the force involved in coercion is applied at some distance, and the will of the coerced agent must somehow be engaged in the determination of the bodily movements. The general strategy involved in all coercion is exemplified in the simple case of armed robbery. You point a gun at someone and demand that she hands over her money. A moment before this, she had no desire to unburden herself of her money, no interest in transferring her money from her possession to that of another. But the situation has changed, and now, of all opinion options before her, handing over her money seems relatively attractive. Under her own steam, moving her own limbs, she removes the money from her pocket and hands it to you. Her situation did not just change, of course. You changed it. What you did, and I think this is the heart of the coercion, was to arrange things so that if so that of the options available, the one that was the least attractive or the most attractive was the very act you wanted the victim to perform. Sorry, the least unattractive or the most attractive was the one you wanted the very victim to perform. Given those options and the victim's judgments and priorities, she chooses and acts. Nobody else controls her limbs or makes that judgment for her. The elements of coercion lie not in her person, mind, or body, but in the manipulation of the circumstances and the manipulation of the options. It will be noted by the clever would-be robber that it does not matter in such a situation whether the gun is loaded or not, or whether or not the robber really would or could pull the trigger. It has only to be credible th to the victim that the gun is loaded and that the person holding it will fire. And dying has to be perceived by that victim at that moment as more undesirable than handing over her money. 
If she thinks the person would not shoot, or if she is feeling cheerfully suicidal, this will not work. If it works, she has been coerced. <laughs> the structure of coercion, then, is this. To coerce someone into doing something, one has to manipulate the situation so that the world so that the world as perceived by the victims presents the victim with a range of options the least unattractive of which or the most attractive of which in the judgment of the victim is the act one wants the victim to do given the centrality of the victim's perception and judgment the plotting co co coercer might manipulate the physical environment but usually would proceed at least in part by manipulating the intended victim's perception and judgment through various kinds of influence and deception. I assume that free and healthy humans would do much that would cohere with and contribute to the satisfaction of each other's interests and the enhancement of each other's capacities for pursuits of those interests. But for many reasons and for many causes, many people want more and different contributions and on very different terms than is consistent with the health and the will of those who would want them from, however amenable, benevolent, or naturally cooperative the latter may be. Hence, there is coercion. In this case of simple robbery, the coercer approaches with relatively limited goals. The structure imposed need to be neither durable nor adaptable. Neither the gun nor the lie need to hold up to much scrutiny. But if you want another to perform for you frequently or regularly, your operation must be complex. People don't like being coerced, and setting up a situation which is reliably and, ad and adaptably coercive requires doing something more about resistance and attempts to escape the imposed dilemma than a simple robber has to do. Hence, coercion is extended, ramified, and laminated as systems of oppression and exploitation. It's going to be like one minute. Exploitation and Oppression Conjure for yourself an image of someone falling a tree, felling a tree with an axe. The axe is a tool, the tree a resource. The axe, properly used, will last for many years. The tree, properly felled, ceases to be. A log comes into being. A tool is by nature or manufacture so constituted and shaped that it is suited to a user's interests in bringing about a certain sort of effect. And so its being and so its being put to use does not require its alteration. 
The case is otherwise with resources or materials. Their uses or exploitations typically transform them. Trees become wood, which becomes pulp, which becomes paper. At each stage, the relation of the parts, the, com the composition and the condition of the thing used are significantly altered in or by the use. The parts and properties of the thing are, stu are stuff or stuff were not initially organized with reference to a certain purpose or telos. They are altered and rearranged so that they are organized with reference to that telos. A transforming manipulation is, character is characteristic of this kind of using of the exploitation of resources or materials. Analogues of this occur in the exploitation of animate beings. In the case of non-human animals, their shapes, their relations of their parts, their constitutions and conditions, and the ways these change or move in the absence of human intervention generally suit them and their behavior to human interests in few and undependable ways. To make such use of animals, one generally has to do some manipulation and alteration to them. Perhaps the simplest of these is just killing them, the direct analog of felling a tree. To get non-human animals, draft animals for instance, to work for them, human animals breed certain species to configurations, tempers, and capacities to respond to, to training and then train them of those species from a very young age to tolerate various bindings and harnesses and the bearing of various weights. These are practices which shape the developing nervous system of the young animals, suppressing certain tendencies to twitch, shy, buck, stamp, or flee. And the humans use stimulus response conditioning to habituate the animals to certain responses to certain human actions and noises. Finally, the animal's movements are significantly shaped and restricted by harnesses, braces, shafts, and various other paraphernalia that connect them to the various tools and machines their movements are to drive, push, or pull. In the end, by its quote-unquote second nature, acquired through processes appropriately called quote-unquote breaking and quote-unquote training, and by the physical restraints placed on it, such a beast can do very little which does not serve some human purpose. Some analog of this quote-unquote breaking must be developed if a person is to exploit another person or group of persons. I have characterized oppression as a systemic network of forces and barriers which tend to, to the reduction and mobilization and molding of the oppressed. Elsewhere, I have empathized, or sorry, emphasized the aspect of reduction and immobilization. Looking at oppression in its relation to exploitation brings the other aspect into sharper focus. Molding, shaping. If you would harness someone else to your wagon, the other must be remodeled. Like any animal, the other is not in the nature of things ready-made to suit anyone's interests but its own. But, unlike non-human animals, this one matches the exploiter in intelligence and finesse of physical abilities. And this one is capable of self-respect, righteousness, and resentment. The human exploiter may not so easily win or outwit the human victim. <laughs> Exploitation and oppression are in tension with each other, as one would expect of things which harmonize. Efficient exploitation requires that the those exploited be relatively mobile, self-animated, and self-maintaining. The more so as the work in question requires greater intelligence, attention, and ingenuity. But it also requires that they do not be free enough, strong enough, or willful enough to resist, escape, or significantly misfit the situation of exploitation. While oppressive structures provide for the latter, those which consist mainly of variations of bondage and confinement are inefficient. A system which relies heavily on physical restriction both prepossesses and generates resistance and attempts to escape. This, in turn, exacerbates the need for bondage and containment. This cycle leads to a situation in which the exploited are subjected to maximal limitations and maximal damage, including the pa passivity of a broken spirit. For some exploiters, the combination of work they want done and the milieu of power in which they operate permits them the inefficiencies wrought by the disabling and annihilative effects of oppression. They may 
have an endless supply of humans to convert to workers, and the work may be such that can be done by someone in shackles and or totally dispirited. But in many cases of relative shortage of workers, the expense of training them, the need for employment of workers' talents and intelligence, and sometimes, perversely enough, the exploiter's personal attachment to the exploited, make such inefficiencies unsatisfactory. Efficient exploitation of quote-unquote human resources requires that the structures that refer the other actions to exploiters' ends must extend beneath the victim's skin. The exploiter has to bring about the partial disintegration and the re-misintegration or reintegration of the other's matters, parts, and properties so that as organized systems, the exploited are oriented to some degree by habits, skill, schedules, values, and taste to the exploiter's ends rather than as they would be otherwise to ends of their own. In particular, the manipulations which adapt and exploit the exploited to a niche in others' economy must accomplish a great reduction of the victim's intolerance of coercion. The best solutions to the problem are those which dissolve it. What the exploiter needs is that the will and intelligence of the victim be disengaged from the project of resistance and escape, but they may not simply be broken or destroyed. Ideally, the disintegration and misintegration of the victim should be accomplished, should accomplish the detachment of the victim's will and and intelligence from the victim's own interests and their attachments to the interests of the exploiter. This will affect a displacement or dissolution of self-respect and will undermine the victim's intolerance of coercion. With that, the situation transcends the initial paradigm, form, or construct of coercion. For if people don't mind be doing what you want them to do, then, in a sense, you can't really be making them do it. In the limiting... In the limiting case, the victim's will and intelligence are wholly transferred to a full engagement in the pursuit of the dominating person's interests. The quote-unquote problem has been that there were two parties with divergent interests. This sort of solution, which is very elegant, as the word is used in logic, is to erase the conflict by reducing the number of interested parties to one. This radical solution can be called quote-unquote enslavement. Enslavement. The mechanisms of enslavement, in cases where it is deliberately or self consciously carried out, have been studied and documented in, among other cases, European colonization of Africa and the enslavement of blacks and indigenous peoples in the quote unquote New World. Kathleen Berry has documented them in her book, Female Sexual Slavery, in the case of what has been called by the misnomer, quote-unquote, white slavery, the enslavement of women and girls for service as prostitutes, wives, concubines, and in the production of pornography. I want to draw on this latter work here because this is the category of slavery that is specific to the system of oppression which subordinates women to men. Many feminists have found it illuminating to compare the situations of women in general enslavement or have seen the situations of women as forms of enslavement. For people in the United States, the use of the concept of slavery can usually be heard only as a reference to the experience and institutions of enslavement of blacks by whites in the United States. For many reasons, such a comparison between women generally and blacks in pre-Civil War enslavement is misleading and politically suspect. But the literal enslavement of women for sexual service, frequently for both sexual and domestic servants, is a venerated, vigorous, current, and universal institution of male-dominated culture, which routinely victimizes girls and women of all racial, economic, and ethnic affiliations all over the world. It is this institution that is the appropriate object of reference when one explores the ways in which women's situations are like, or are, forms of slavery. According to Barry, the strategy for, for converting half-grown, willful girl 
or a reasonably independent and competent woman to a servile prostitute or a passive concubine has three stages, abduction, seasoning, and criminalization. Under the heading of abduction come kidnapping and seduction, or any act by which the abductor can remove the girl or woman from a setting which is familiar to her to a setting which is totally unfamiliar to her, where she has no allies and no knowledge of what resources are potentially available. Usually, he drugs her. When she comes to consciousness of her predicament, she is temporarily disoriented and ignorant about where she is, what city, what floor of the building, etc. The victim has very little information about her surroundings, dulled wits for assimilation or for assimilating that what information she does have, and no reliable quote-unquote other to criticize or validate her perceptions or judgments. In other words, the abductor has stripped her of the most ordinary powers and resources which even the most socially powerless person usually retains. She is frightened and oriented to escape, but he has imposed on her by force a condition in which she can do almost nothing on her own behalf. The next stage is seasoning. While he holds her captivity in captivity and isolation, he brutalizes the victim in as many ways as there are to brutalize. Rape, beatings, verbal and physical degradation, deprivation, intense and enduring discomfort, credible threats of murder. The abductor's brutality functions in several ways. By placing the victim in a life-threatening and absolutely averse situation, he maximizes the urgency of the victim's taking action in her on her own behalf while making it utterly impossible for her to do so. This puts maximum force into the processes of alienating her from herself through total helplessness. The result is radical loss of self-esteem, self-respect, and any sense of capacity or agency. The brutality also establishes intimacy, both by being invasive and by the intensity of the one-on-one -on -one contact. At a certain point, the abductor shifts from un unabating, unabating brutality to intermittent and varying brutality. This creates occasions for positive feelings on the part of the victim. She is now in a world of disordered moral proportions, where not being beaten, not being under a threat of imminent death, not being permitted or being permitted to urinate when she needs to, etc., have become occasions for gratitude. Gratitude is a positive and a binding effect. The intimacy is intensified. From now on, any time the man is not torturing her, she feels herself to be relatively well treated. The process of reconstructing the elements of the person into the shape of a slave has begun. The shift to less constant abuse is also perva a pervasive kind of empowerment of the victim. After having been in a situation where her, her presence as agent have been reduced to nothing, she now has the opportunity to try to act in support of her physical survival. She can try to discover what pleases and what displeases the man and try to please him and avoid displeasing him, thereby avoiding or postponing beatings or degradation or being killed. She has been annihilated as an agent. When she is restored to agency, it is kept at a it is kept at a remove from her own interest and self-preservation. She can act indirectly and negatively in the interests of her physical survival and freedom from pain by trying to behave in this in ways which will forestall or avoid the man's abuse. But any direct presence of herself to herself, any direct self-preserving or self-serving behavior will displease him and thus be counterproductive. If he is any good at this, the man will make it a point to be arbitrary and capricious in his pleasures and displeasures and be very brutal when he is brutal. This will make the victim's task of anticipating his will extremely difficult and keep the stakes high. All of this draws her closer to him. Her attention will be on him constantly and exclusively. Her every resource of intelligence, will, and sensitivity will be drawn into the most intense engagement with and focus upon him. She is likely to become quote-unquote clinging and quote-unquote possessive, not wanting to let him out of her sight. All of the will and resources she would draw upon to survive are thus channeled to the service of his interests. 
The final stage, criminalization, is not necessary in order for the abductor to return the woman in to return the woman in his relationship with her to a more public sphere where he can turn sorry the final stage criminalization is necessary in order for the abductor to return the woman and his relationship with her to a more public sphere where he can turn the newly wrought relationship to his economic benefit he forces the woman or girl to engage in or be an accomplice to some criminal act or acts larceny drug traffic murder prostitution kidnapping by this she becomes and knows she becomes a criminal part of the quote-unquote underworld now she cannot return to family or friends or turn to the police. As a female and a criminal, she has nowhere to escape to and a great deal to, to be protected from. Her procurer, her procurer and his associates become her protectors from the violence and scorn of the straight society. She now depends on him for protections from fates worse than he. He who is familiar is in whom in whose domain she probably can survive by being and doing whatever he wants, and in whose world she will find the only acceptance, economic viability, or social interaction and emotional life now available to her. She is now his. Let us review the metaphysics of this process. Brutality and radical helplessness creates... A fisher. The animal intelligence has no vehicle. The animal body misjudges and is inappropriately grateful. The intelligent body ceases to be. Intelligence and body bodiliness are surrend are sundered, unable to ground or defend each other or themselves. Mind and body, thus made separate, are then reconnected, but only indirectly. Their interactions and communications now mediated by the man's will and interests. Mind and body can preserve themselves only by subordinating each other to him. The woman or girl now serves herself only by serving him, and can interpret herself only by reference to him. He has rent her in two, and grafted the raw ends to himself so she can act, but only in his interest. She has been annexed, and is, and is his appendage. In the limiting case, the slave is a robot, its behavior determined by the interests of another, its will by the will of another, its body functioning as a vehicle of another. But the condition of the slave, as I see it, is not exactly that which Mary Daly called quote-unquote robotitude or de Beauvoir called quote-unquote only not dying. The slave substance is assimilated to the master, a transference T. Gray Atkinson called quote unquote metaphysical cannibalism. Although the slave is not engaged in quote unquote surpassing herself, she is engaged in surpassing. She is engaged in the master's quote unquote surpassing himself. Her substance is organized towards his quote unquote transcendence. And then there's um, a quote here. By marriage, the husband and the wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband, under whose wing, protection, and cover she performs everything. Sir William Blackstone, Commentaries on the law, Laws of England, London, 1813. In a liberal college town in the United States in the late 70s, a woman went to get a library card at the local public library. She was told she could not get it without her husband's signature. A firm policy, no. She would need no one else's signature if she were single. This is true. Okay. The Arrogant Eye
the idea of there being more than one body's worth of substance, will and wit, and wit lined up behind one's project has its appeal. As one woman said after going through the reasons, my God, who wouldn't want a wife? Ty Gray Atkinson pointed out in her analysis of the roots of oppression that there is an enormous gap between what one can do and what one can imagine doing. Humans have what she referred to as a quote-unquote constructive imagination, which, though obviously a blessing in some ways, also is a source of great frustration. For it provides a constant tease of imagined accomplishments and imagined threats to neither of which we physically equal. The majority of people do not deal with this problem and tempta temptation by enslaving others overtly and by force, though the processes which capture the battered wife and attach her to him, as Barry pointed out, very like the processes of the procurer. But many, many people, most of them male, are in a culture and material position to accomplish to a great degree the same end by uh, any by other means and under other descriptions, means dis and descriptions which obscure to them and to their victims the fact that their end is the same. The end? Acquisition of the service of others. The means? Variations on the same theme of disintegration as an integrated human organism and grafting its substance to oneself. The Bible says that all of nature, including women, exists for man. Man in, is invited to subdue the earth and have dominion over every living thing, all of which is said to exist, quote-unquote, to you, quote-unquote, for meat. Woman is created to be man's helper. This captures in myths Western civilization's primary answer to the philosophical question of man's place in nature, everything that is a resource for man's exploitation. With this worldview, men see with arrogant eyes which organize everything seen with reference to themselves and their own in interests. The, the arrogating perceiver is a teleologist, a believer of e that everything exists and happens for some purpose, and he tends to animate things, imagining attitudes towards himself as the animated motives. Everything is either quote-unquote for me or quote-unquote against me. This is the kind of vision that interprets the rock one trips on as hostile, the bolt one cannot loosen as stubborn, the woman who made meatloaf when he wanted spaghetti as quote-unquote bad, though he didn't say that was what he wanted. The arrogant perceiver does not countenance the possibility that the other is independent, indifferent. The feminist separatist can only be a man-hater. Nature is called, quote-unquote, mother. <clears throat> the arrogant perceiver falsifies. The nature, who makes both green beans and basilis botulinus, doesn't give a passing damn whether humans live or die. But he also coerces the objects of his perception into satisfying the condition, conditions his perception imposes. He tries to accomplish in a glance what the slave masters and batterers accomplished by extended use of physical force, and to a great extent, he succeeds. He manipulates the environments, perception, and judgment of her whom he perceives so that he recognized so that her recognized options are limited, and the course she chooses will be such as coheres with his purposes. The seer himself is an element of her environment. The structures of his perception are as solid a fact in her situation as are the structures of a chair which seats her too low or of gestures which threaten. How one sees another and how one expects the other to behave are in tight interdependence, and how one expects another to behave is a large factor in determining how the other does behave. Naomi Weistein in... Oh. Naomi Weinstein in The Psychology Constructs in Psychology Constructs the Female reviewed experiments which shows dramatic show dramatically that this is true. 
This is a quote. For instance, in one experiment, subjects were to assign numbers to pictures of men's faces, with high numbers representing the subject's judgment that the man in the picture was a successful person, and low numbers representing the subject's judgment that the man in the picture was an unsuccessful person. One group of experimenters was told that the subjects tended to rate the faces high. Another group of the experimenters were told that the subjects tended to rate the faces low. Each group of the experimenters was instructed to follow precisely the same procedure. They were required to read, the, read to subjects a set of instructions and to say nothing else. For the 375 subjects run, the results show clearly that these subjects, that those subjects who performed the task with experimenters who expected high ratings gave high ratings, and those subjects who performed the task with experimenters who were expecting low ratings gave low ratings. When experimenters think that the rats they are working with were bred for high intelligence, the rats they are working with learn faster. When the experimenter thinks that their rats are bred for low intelligence, the, rat learns, the rats learn less well. And children believed by their teachers to have high IQs show dramatic increases in their IQs. Weistein concludes, quote, The correctness of the changed condition, conditions produced by experiments by experimentation is a fact of reality. In some extremely important ways, people are what you expect them to be, or at least they behave as you expect them to behave, end quote. The experiments only boldly outline something we all know from experience. Women experience the coerciveness of this kind of quote-unquote influence when men perversely impose sexual meanings on our every movement. We know that the palpable pleasure of a man's reduction of our ob of our objection to an occasion for our instruction. Women do not so often experience ourselves imposing expectations on situations and making them stick, but some of the most awesome stories of women's successful resistance to male violence involved a woman's ex expecting the male assailant into the position of a little boy in the power of his mother. The power of expectations is enormous. It should be engaged and responded to attentively and with care. The arrogant perceiver engages it with the same unconsciousness with which he engages his muscles when he writes his name. The arrogant perceiver's expectation creates in the space about him a sort of vacuum mold in which the other is sucked and held. But the other is not sucked into this structure always, nor always without resistance. In the absence of his manipulation, the other is not organized primarily with reference to his interest. To this extent, that she is not shaped of to his will, does not fit the confirmation he imposes, there is friction, anomaly, or incoherence in his world. To the extent that he notices this, incongru this incongruity, he can experience it in no other way than as something wrong with her. His perception is is arrogating. His senses tell him that the world and everything in it, with the occasional exception of other men, is in the nature of things there for him, that she is by her constitution and telos his servant. He believes his senses. If women does not serve him, it can only be because he is not a sufficiently skilled master or because there is something wrong with the woman. He may try to manage things better, but when that fails, he can only conclude that she is defective, unnatural, flawed, broken, abnormal, damaged, sick. His norms of virtue and health are set according to the degree of congruence of the object of perception with the seer's interests. This is exactly wrong. Though anyone might wish, for any of many reasons, to contribute to another's pursuit of her or his interests, the health and integrity of an organism is a matter of its being organized largely towards its own interests and welfare. The arrogant perceiver knows this in his own case, but he arrogates everything to himself and thus perceives as healthy or quote-unquote right everything that relates to him in his own substance does when he is healthy. But what's sauce for the gander is sauce for the goose. She 
is healthy and quote unquote working right when her substance is organized primarily on principles which align it to her interests and welfare. Cooperation is essential, of course, but it will not do that I arrange everything so that you get enough exercise. For me to be healthy, I must get enough exercise. My being adequately exercised is logically independent of your being so. The arrogant perceiver's perception of the other's normacy, normalcy or defectiveness is not only dead wrong, it is coercive. It manipulates the other's perception and judgment at the root by misleading the unwholesome as healthy and what is wrong as right. One judges and chooses within a framework of values, notions as to what good and good for you pertain to. The elementary robber coercer leaves the framework alone and manipulates only the situation. The commercial advertiser may misrepresent particular items or options as being good or good for you. But what we have in the case of the arrogant perceiver is the misdefining of good and healthy. If one has the culture and the institutional power to make the misidentification stick, one can turn the whole other person right around to oneself by this one simple trick. This is the sort of thing that makes the quote-unquote reversals Mary Daly talks about in gynecology so evil and so dangerous. If one does not get the concepts right and wrong, healthy and unhealthy right, and in particular, if one gets them wrong in the specific way determined by the arrogant eye, one cannot take care of oneself. This is the most fundamental kind of harm. It is, in effect, mayhem. A maiming which appear, impairs a person's ability to defend oneself. Mayhem is very close kin, both morally and logically, to murder. The procurer and slaver, working with overt force, constructs a situation in which the victim's pursuit of her own survival or health and her attempt um, to be good always require, as a matter of practical fact in that situation, actions which serve him. In the world constructed by the arrogant eye, this same connection is established not by terror, but by definition. There's like a one-page excerpt here. <clears throat> Western philosophy and science have, for the most part, been built on the presumption of the intelligibility of the universe. This is the doctrine that everything in the universe and the universe itself can, at least in principle, be understood and comprehended by human intelligence, reason, and understanding. Western philosophy and science have, for the most part, been committed to the simplicity theory of truth. The simplest theory that accounts for the data is the true theory. Theories are simplest, which postulate the fewest entities, require the fewest hypotheses, generate um, predictions by the fewest calculations, etc. The connection seems clear. Only if the truth is simple can the universe be intelligible. But why believe either of these principles? If someone believes that the world is made for him to have dominion over, and he is made to exploit it, he must believe that he and the world are so made that he can, at least in principle, achieve and maintain domination over everything. But you can't put things to use if you don't know how they work. So he must believe that he can, or at least in principle, understands everything. If the world exists for man, it must be usably intelligible, which means it must be simple enough for him to understand. A usable universe is an intelligible universe is a simple universe. If something seems to be unintelligible, you can decide it is unnatural or unreal. Or you can decide it is what is really real and then declare that you have discovered the problem of knowledge. Or having declared that what seems unintelligible to be the really real, you can claim it is, after all, intelligible, but only to the extraordinary few who, in spite of being so few, somehow can be normative of what man really is. And so it goes with the philosophy and the science of the arrogant eye. <clears throat>
The official story about men who batter women is that they do so in large part because they suffer quote-unquote low (laughs) self-esteem. What this suggests to me is that they suffer a lack of arrogance and cannot fully believe in themselves as centers about which all else but some other men revolves and to which all else refers. Because of this, they cannot effectively exercise the power of that expectation. But as men, they quote-unquote know they are supposed to be center- the centers of the universe, so they are reduced to trying to create by force what more successful men, men who carry off masculinity better, create by arrogant perception. This is, perhaps, one reason why some of the men who do batter, who do not batter, have contempt for the men who do. The loving eye. The attachment of the well-broken slave to the master has been confused with love. Under the name of love, a willing and unconditional servitude has been promoted as something ecstatic, noble, fulfilling, and even redemptive. All praise is sung for the devoted wife who loves the husband and children she is willing to live for, and to the brave man who loves the God he is willing to kill for, the country he is willing to die for. We can be taken in by this equation of servitude with love, because we make two mistakes at once. We think of both servitude and love, that they are selfless or unselfish. We tend to think of them as attachments in which the person is not engaged because of self-interest and does not pursue self-interest. The wife who married for money did not marry for love, we think. The mercenary soldier is despised by the loyal patriot. And the slave, we think, is selfless because she can do nothing but serve the interests of another. But this is wrong. Neither is the slave selfless, nor is the lover. It is one mark of a voluntary association that the one person can survive displeasing the other, defying the other, dissociating from the other. The slave, the battered wife, the not-so-battered wife, is constantly in jeopardy. She is in a situation where she cannot, or reasonably believes she cannot, survive without the other's provisions and protection, and where experience has made it credible to her that the other may kill her or abandon her, and if and when she displeases him but she survives at least for a while she may like patricia hurst retain her own will to her own survival in which case she does quote-unquote for the other is ultimately done quote-unquote for herself more consistently and more profoundly than could ever be the case in voluntary association in her situation of utter dependence and peril every detail of the other's actions interests and wishes are ineluctably and directly, as a matter of empirical fact, connected with her interests in survival. She does not see the other as, or expect the other to be, organized to the service of her interests, quite to the contrary, but she cannot fail to interpret the other always with an eye to what will keep her from being killed or abandoned. Her eye is not arrogating, but it is the furthest thing from disinterested, She does not have the option of setting her interests aside, of not calculating them. On the other hand, the victim may survive, as story of O presents her, or as the picture is told, uh, or as is pictured in old, in the old Geritol commercials, solely because the other wishes it. In story of O, the master would be most displeased to find that O was interested in her survival for any reason other than what he wanted her to other than that he wanted her to survive. That would be at least the last vestige of quote-unquote willfulness, a telltale sign of the imperfection of her quote-unquote love for him. 
In the Geritol commercial, the woman, quote unquote, takes care of herself because her family needs her. Her husband will, quote unquote, keep her because she she serves so devotedly. In this latter case, if it ever really is the case, as I am pessimistic enough to think it is, the slave slash wife really is not motivated by self-interest, but by her behavior towards and perception of the others, it is still not disinterested. She has assumed his interest. She now sees with his eye, his arrogant eye. In a case like that of Patricia, Patricia Hurst, in which one might say the enslavement is not perfect, the victim's self-interest is present and central, it is the fulcrum of the coercion. In the second, the victim's self-interest is simply replaced by the master's interests. In neither case is the victim disinterested or, or selfless in her actions toward or perception of the master. She acts from her interest and for her, herself, or from his interest and for herself. One who loves is not selfless either. If the loving eye is in any sense disinterested, it is not that the seer has lost herself, has no interests, or ignores or denies her interests. Any of these would seriously incapacitate her as a perceiver. What is the case, surely, is that unlike the slave or the master, the loving perceiver can see without the presupposition that the other possesses a constant threat or that the other exists for the seer's service. Nor does she see with the other's eye instead of her own. Her interest does not blend, and the seer and the seen, either empirically by terror or by a priori, by conceptual links forged by the arrogant eye. One who sees with a loving eye is separate from the other whom she, she sees. There are boundaries between them. She and the others are two. Their interaction... Oh, sorry. Their interests are not identical. They are not blended in vital parasitic or symbiotic relations, nor does she believe that they are or try to pretend they are. The loving eye is contrary of, to, of the arrogant eye. The loving eye knows the independence of the other. It is the eye of the seer who knows that nature is indifferent. It is the eye of the one who knows that to know the seen, one must consult something other than one's will and interests, and fears and imagination. One must look at the thing. One must look and listen and check and question. The loving eye is one that pays a certain sort of attention. This attention can acquire can require a discipline, but not a self-denial. The discipline is one of self-knowledge, knowledge of the scope and boundary of the self. What is required is that one knows is that one know what are one's interests, desires, and loathings. One one's pro projects, hungers, fears, and wishes, and that one know what is and what is not determined by these. In particular, it is a matter of being able to tell one's own interests from those of others and of, and of knowing where oneself leaves off and another begins. Perhaps in another world, this would be easy and not a matter of discipline, but here we are brought up among metaphysical cannibalism and their robots. Some of us are taught we can have everything. Some of us are taught we can have nothing. Either way, we will acquire a great wanting. The wanting doesn't care about the truth. It simplifies where the truth is complex. It invents when it should be investigating. It expects when it should be waiting to find out. It would turn everything to its satisfaction. And what it finally thinks it cannot thus maneuver, it hates. But the necessary discipline is not a denial of the wanting. On the contrary, it is a discipline of knowing and owning the wanting, identifying it, claiming it, knowing its scope, and through all of this, knowing its distance from the truth. The loving eye does not make the object of perception into something edible, does not try to assimilate it, does not reduce it in size to... to the size of the seer's desire, fear, and imagination, and hence does not have to simplify. 
It knows the complexity of other things as something which will forever present new things to be known. The science of the loving eye would favor the complexity theory of truth and presuppose the endless interestingness of the universe. The loving eye seems generous to its object, though it means neither to give nor to take, for not being invaded, not being coerced, not being annexed, must be felt in a world such as ours as a great gift. The Beloved We who would love women and well, who would change ourselves and change the world so that it is possible to love women well, we need to imagine the possibilities for what women might be if we lived free of the material and perceptual forces which subordinate women to men. The point is not to imagine a female human animal unaffected by other humans around it, uninfluenced by its own and others' perceptions of others' interests, unaffected by culture. The point is only to imagine women, not enslaved, to imagine these intelligent, willful, and female bodies not subordinated in service to males, individually or via institutions, or to anybody in any way, not pressed into a shape that suits an arrogant eye. The forces which we want to imagine ourselves free of are a guide to what we might be when free of them. They mark the shapes... Sorry. They mark the shape they mold us to, but they also suggest by implication the shape we might have been without the molding. One can guess something of the magnitude of, and direction of the tendencies the thing would exhibit when free by attending to the magnitudes and directions of the forces required to confine and shape it. For instance, much pressure is applied to the point of our verbal behavior enforcing silence or limiting our speech. One can reason that without the force, we might show ourselves to be loquacious and perhaps prone to oratory, not to mention prone to saying things unpleasant to male ears. The threats of rape is a sorry, the threat of rape is a force of great magnitude, which is, among other things, applied against our movement about cities, towns, and countryside. The implication is that without a great many women being women might prove to be very prone to nomadic lives of exploration and adventure. Why else should so much force be required to keep us at home? But to speak more generally, the forces of men's material and the perceptual violence mold women to dependence upon man in every meaning of dependence, contingent upon, conditional upon, necessitated by, defined in terms of, incomplete or unreal without, requiring the support or assistance of, being a subordinate of, being an Apaturance too. Dependence is forced upon us. It is not rash to speculate that without this force, much, most of, or all, what most of or all of us do would not be contingent upon, conditional upon, necessitated by, or subordinated to any man, or what belongs to or pertains to a man, men, or masculinity. What we are and how we are or what we would be and how we would be if not molded by the arrogating eye is not molded to man, not dependent. I do not speak here of a specious absolute independence that would mean never responding to another's need and never needing another's response. I conceive here simply of a being whose needs and responses are not bound by concepts or by terror in a dependence upon those of another. The loving eye makes the correct assumption. The object of seeing is another being whose existence and character are logically independent of the seer, and who may be practically or empirically independent of any particular respect of any particular time. <laughs> it is not an easy thing to grasp the meaning or the truth of this quote-unquote independence, nor is a clear or secure belief in it at all common, even among those who identify themselves as feminists. The inability to think it is one of the things that locks men in eternal infantilism. It is one of the things that makes women endlessly susceptible to deep uncertainty in our political and epistemological claims and to nearly fatal indecisiveness in our own actions.
When we try to think ourselves independent, to think ourselves women not mediated by men or man, when we attempt, what we attempt is both prodigious and terrifying, since by our own wills we would be led to that fringe of the world where language and meaning let us go, let go their hold on our lives. So, understandably, we suffer failures of imagination and failures of courage. We have a great we have to a great extent learned the arrogant boy child's vocabulary and to identify with him and see his eye. We have learned to think of agency and power very much as he does. What we may do, we may try what we may do when we try to imagine ourselves independent is just slip ourselves slyly into his shoes and imagining ourselves the center of the universe, the darlings of Mother Nature and the cherished sisters of all other women. Much of the radical feminist art and theory which has nurtured my imagination has been characterized by occasional streaks of this kind of romanticism. Some of it is much influenced by such ideas of a quote-unquote built-in perfect harmony among women and between men and nature, women and nature. Something of this sort is part of the romantic element in Mary Daly's gynecology. It is in Susan Griffin's Women in Nature. It is very prevalent, I do not say universal, in the literature and art of women's spirituality. The Wanderground, a fantasy novel which has been very successful in feminist circles, developed such a romanticism quite explicitly. This tendency of thought is markedly absent from two other feminist fantasy novels, The Walk to the End of the Earth and Mother Lines. And these have been, for the, that very reason, disliked and criticized by some feminists for not presenting a feminist vision. The same failure of imagination which seduced some other radical feminist thinking into a rose-colored vision of ourselves and nature has much more fundamentally shaped the quote-unquote civil rights wing of feminist thought. The woman who wants quote-unquote equality in many cases simply wants to be there too as one of the men for whom God, men's God made everything quote-unquote for meat. It has been suggested to me that we will fail in those efforts of imagination partly because we insist on reinventing the wheel. We might give womankind some kind, some credit. We might suppose that not all women lead and have led male-mediated lives, and that the lives of the more independent women could provide material for the stimulation and correction of our imaginations. Women of exceptional gifts and creative achievements there are, and women whose lives do not follow the beaten path, but also when one looks closely at the lives of the women presented by history or in one's experience as exceptional, one often sees some not-so-exceptional casual factors like the patronage of exceptional men, for which one must assume the women pay in some coin or other, and the signs of peculiar fears and strange lapses of imagination. Why did so powerful an individual as Gertrude Stein speak only in code and hardly at all in public of her passionate relationship with Alice B. Talkless? Why did brilliant suffragists, white women, fail politically under the pressures of racism? Why did Simone Weil hate Jews? And why did she think suffering would make her good? Why did Simone de Beauvoir adhere to the misogynist Jean-Paul Sartre? I know gifted lesbian feminist scholars who identify themselves as lesbian separatists and are passionately committed to making, quote unquote, the boys in their field recognize their work, talent and intelligence. This makes no sense. And I have heard women whose accomplishments um, and spirit show them capable of material and intellectual independence talking about their husbands in ways that make it inexplicable that they remain married to those men. Feminists writing... Sorry, feminist writing, especially autobiographical writing, is full of examples of the most disappointing of all the exceptional women to whom we would turn, to whom we have turned, the mothers, the grandmothers, aunts, sisters, cousins, who have in our own real lives, in our own lives, real, who have in our own real lives been an example of strength, power, independence, and solidarity with other women and of whom we say almost grievingly, quote, she really was or is a feminist, a dyke, though she would rather die than be called by that name, end quote. 
The answers to the puzzle puzzles all of these women present are, of course, very complex and individual. But I think there is at least one common thread. There is in the fabric of our lives, not always visible, but always affecting its nature and strength, a mortal dread of being outside the field of vision of the arrogant eye. That eye gives all things meaning by connecting all things to each other by way of references to one point, man. We fear that if we are not in that web of meaning, there will be no meaning. Our work will be meaningless, our lives of no value, our accomplishments empty, our identities illusory. The reason for this dread, I suggest, is that for most of us, including the exceptional, a woman existing outside that field of vision of, of, vision of man's arrogant eye, is really inconceivable. This is a terrible disability. If we have no intuition of ourselves as independent, unmediated beings in the world, then we cannot conceive ourselves surviving our liberation, for what our liberation will do is dissolve the structures and dismantle the mechanisms by which woman is mediated by man. If we cannot imagine ourselves surviving this, we certainly will not make it happen. There probably is really no distinction in the end between imagining and imagination and courage. We can't imagine what we can't face, and we can't face what we can't imagine. To break out of the structures of the arrogant eye, we have to dare to rely on ourselves, to make meaning, and we have to imagine ourselves being capable of that, capable of weaving the web of meaning which will hold us in some kind of intelligibility. We do manage this to some extent, but we also wobble and threaten to fall, like a beginner on a bicycle who does not get up enough momentum, partly for lack of nerve. We have correctly intuited that the making of meaning is social and requires a certain community of perception. We are also individually timid and want quote unquote support. So it is only against a background of imagined community of ultimate harmony and perfect agreement that we dare to think is possible to make such meaning. This brings us into an arrogance of our own, for we make it a prerequisite of our, for our own construction of meaning that other women be what we need them to be to constitute the harmonious community of agreement that we require. Some women refuse to participate at all in the meaning construction quote, because feminists are divided and can't agree among ourselves, end quote. Some who do participate threaten to return to the father's fold or to write others out of the movement if unanimity cannot be achieved. In other words, we threaten to fail in imagination and courage like all the other exceptional and ordinary women if our sisters do not or will not harmonize and agree with us. Meaning is indeed something that arises among two or more individuals and requires some degree of agreement in perception and values. It also tends to generate and require community the necess and the necessary degree of agreement. The community required for meaning, however, is precisely not a homogeneous herd, for without difference, there is no meaning. Meaning is a system of connection and distinctions among different and distinguishable things. The hypothetical homogeneous community which we imagine we need could not be the community in which we can make ourselves intelligible immediately to and for ourselves. The liberated woman cannot be presumed to quote-unquote suit us, and such presumption would simply keep us from actually um, imagining her free for in our own effort of imagination we impose upon her if we feed our vision of images filtered through filtered through what we suppose to be our own necessities we will be disappointed and resentful and will end up doing violence we need to know women as independent subjectively in our own being and in our own appreciation of others if we are to know it in ourselves, I think we may have have to be under the gaze of a loving eye and the eye which presupposes our independence. 
The loving eye does not prohibit women's experiencing the world directly, does not force her to experience it by way of the interested interpretations of the seer in whose visual field she moves. In this situation, she can experience directly in her bones the contingent character of her relations to all others and to nature. If we are to know women's independence in the beings of others, I think we may have to cast our loving eye towards them and wait and see.